Coming up, new BlackBerry apps, text as I say, not as I do, and Zuckerberg must die. That's all next on Tech News Today. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, June 18th, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Slingbox. Watch your favorite new TV shows, old TV shows, any TV shows when you're away from home with Slingbox. Check out Slingbox at a Best Buy near you or at slingbox.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Becky Worley, I'm filling in for Tom Merritt. And sorry, you? I almost talked over you. I'm Sarah Lane, <gasps> Becky. But we're, you know that. We're just getting started here I know. together. So you but is it, you're not Tom. I'm not you. It's, every, it's Neither one of us chairs. have beards. It's right. very confusing. Yet. Uh, behind the board is our savage producer, John Slanina, a.k.a. Jammer B. What up, and Jammer B? This is the show where we spew out all of the day's tech headlines, and we try to make sense. I mean, make sense of it all, right? right? Along with you. And all we, of us together. we do try to make sense, though. That's a goal. That's a goal. <laughs> Joining us today is Jim Lauderback, CEO over at Revision 3 and uh, former boss to most of us. Chowderhead, welcome. Hello. Thank you. It's good to be here, guys. Hey, yeah. Jim. Good to see you. Hey, Sarah. I feel like I've been on a lot of shows with you lately. Yeah, it's just this and Twit, but Twit just went on and on and on, so. Yeah, no, that was good. partly my Well, fault. you were in New York, and now you're back, so. Yeah, so. Now you're a real employee. Well, now we can be on lots more shows together. Good times. Oh, fun. It's like we are starting the day today with uh, big news from Apple. Nah, actually, let's just rephrase that. Medium news from Apple. They have a makeover of their mobile me service. They've announced an upgrade to mobile me, mostly tweaks, uh, email that can access external addresses, SSL in the browser, uh, faster performance, uh, an iPhone app that can actually help you track your iPad if you lose it. And the big news is not good news. Despite rumors of it being free, actually, it'll be $99 for the service. Are you a mobile me? I am. And I kind of like to think of mobile me as, yes, I'd love it to be free. But I've actually used this to find a lost iPhone in the depths of Golden Gate Park, uh, which is a big park for anyone who hasn't been there before. So I kind of like to think of mobile me as insurance what for my you? devices. And now for my iPad, too, I'm pretty into that. And that's the thing. I mean, I think it's really interesting that you've got Hotmail, Gmail providing a lot of similar, you know, Yahoo providing a lot of similar functionality, but free of cost. Jim, what's, how does Apple get away with this? I don't know. You know, I was thinking about this. I mean, first of all, if that's all you're really using it for, Sarah, it's kind of like, what, OnStar for your iPhone. <laughs> but, but, but Jim, it, you don't it, understand. I misplace things a lot. <laughs> so yeah, this, is, I, I, this is actually yeah, a service yeah, yeah. that really works for me. <laughs> <laughs> but here's here's what I was thinking about when I saw this story, and I'm not a user, as you guys know, I'm probably the anti-Sarah because I'm sort of the Windows user over here who just doesn't do anything Apple. But I think everybody who uses Mac stuff, go for the last two years, count up how much of your disposable income you've given to Apple. This is just another hundred bucks a month or a year or whatever that you're giving to Apple. And I got to think, you know, I have no problem with Apple taking all that money, but count it up. And I think you'd be shocked about how much money you're actually spending on Apple products and services every month. Well, given the amount of cash that they have in reserve, I think it makes sense. Your point is well taken. We are uh, spending a lot of money with them. And um, it'll be interesting. I was really hoping that they would go free with this model because I would convert if they went free. And a lot of folks Yahoo. were expecting it, too. So this isn't the first time that Apple's been like, no, no, still getting the $100 a year from you. But... It would be nice. Throw us a bone. Maybe Last Jim would convert. Maybe. No, uh, you know what? I have uh, <laughs> my own domain, louderback.com, and I get my email there. I really don't need to spend money on another domain. True, true. But now they're saying they will handle external email addresses, so that might be a, um, an incentive for some folks. Now, last week, uh, iPhone users and Apple fans who were subscribed to the AT&T data plan had a an end to the unlimited data and a new tiered pricing plan. And now Verizon has said, yeah, we're going to do the same thing. So, uh, and is anybody really surprised about that? Not really. Their CF, their CEO, sorry, CFO, John Killian said to Bloomberg, we probably need to change the design of our pricing where it will not be totally unlimited. It won't be a flat rate. 
Uh, he's basically saying that as the network re readies to deploy 4G, they expect an increased consumption of data as the speeds go up and that they have to do something to manage the load preemptively. Well, and there will be an increase of consumption. I mean, that's just a given, you know? The well, pipe, but what, pipe you know, is look, bigger, it, then people are going to use it. But why? Like, if you've got, all of a sudden, your, your network is going from, what, a megabit per second to four megabits per second. Sure, it's going to be a little faster, but are they going to put that many more people on the network? They're basically quadrupling capacity or some number like that. So I think this is Verizon just trying to, you know, basically to manage their network, sure. But I think it's an opportunity for somebody like Sprint. Well, I'll bet Sprint, because, you know, Sprint's the underdog. They've been, you know, everybody's been poo-pooing them. I'll bet Sprint goes and says, you know, forget it. We're going to be as much data as you want for free as long as you want as a way to, to really compete. So you think Sprint's going to stay unlimited data and watch everybody else cap us? Yeah, I huh. do. All right. Well, let's see. They need to that do prediction something. prediction rolls <laughs> true. I'd like to see that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that. Chevrolet has announced that the first 4,400 buyers of the Chevy Volt will get a free 240-volt charging station. Uh, the Department of Energy has given them a grant that will allow them to subsidize um, this charging station rollout for the first early adopters of the Chevy Volt. Um, in return, people who get that free charging station will have to have their charging habits monitored by the DOE so that they can kind of get a sense of how people are charging and recharging and understand. I drive a lot, so sue me. <laughs> I like driving. But the, the interesting thing is, so the Volt will come with the 120 plug-in charger automatic. Chevy says that takes 10 hours to recharge. Okay. So you come home from work, you plug in, you ain't going anywhere on electricity at least. You can go someplace on gas for another 10 hours. The 240 takes the charging time down to four hours. Aha. Uh -huh. But get this. So there's rapid recharge op options. So the Tesla Model S will have a 480 volt recharger that only takes 45 minutes to recharge. And you can see that Tesla would need to do that because they don't have a gas option. They're electricity only right so you can you can have one of the teslas go out to a nice meal well i guess i guess the charger is going to have to be installed in your garage somewhere so it's not like you can just sort of like charge on the fly for 45 minutes whenever you're going shopping for a little while yeah and i mean that the s has a pretty good range i can't remember if it's two or three hundred miles maybe even more so i mean you're hopefully unless you're driving to tahoe for lunch um you know you'd you'd, you'd be able to take a charging line with you but for the rapid recharge it sounds like you need a special station do we know how much a charging station like this a 240 volt would go for if it wasn't being subsidized i mean what kind of a deal are people getting here i looked on the chevy site and they didn't have a price point on it but um from some of the reports it said a thousand to two thousand dollar savings mm -hmm. um and i think you know wow. if you're I mean, that's pretty significant, and it's definitely an incentive. It's definitely puts Nis Nissan in the, okay, Leaf, right. what are you going to do for us right. category. Yeah. Um, but, I, I mean, I just, I find it really fascinating. I mean, I have solar on my house, so electricity is dirt cheap for me. Um, it's basically kind of um, amortized over the lifetime of me paying off the cost of the solar. But the bottom line is, I'm a perfect candidate at, at this stage of my life for an EV, and I definitely think recharging times are a huge disincentive. So the faster you can get these things going, the better. Yeah, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past. I mean, yeah, I'm not doing a lot of spontaneous road trips, but I don't like the idea of saying, well, now I'm home and I can't do anything for another 10 hours. You well, know, or at wait, least get Sarah, a big, big charge for another 10 hours. You're, you're assuming that you can't plug it in for an hour and then go to the store and back. Well, no, I'm not I, assuming which I that. Don't know, I, 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 I would I would assume that it's it's cumulative, right? But it's still it it, it makes me it, the idea of it kind of makes me feel a little bit trapped. Um, I think you know uh, uh, having shorter charge times in general is just a better incentive for people. Yeah, to I be agree like, with you. Okay, 100%. this is you know this is going to work with my life and convenient for me, and I won't have to change too many things. A good comment in the chat room said that ninety nine percent of homes don't have four eighty capability, four eighty volt capability at home. So that makes another point that a lot of those I don't I haven't verify that but that's another point which is are those rapid recharge stations only sort of infrastructure developed at you know big companies or public points or that's, so that's interesting a friend of mine ordered a tesla already uh i supposed to get it this year and i wonder if he <laughs> has the capacity to charge that in his new place mm -hmm. microsoft suing spammers Good. again 
good. <laughs> well, my, these are particularly lame spammers, but go ahead and fill everybody in on why. <laughs> Microsoft developed two anti-spam technologies to help ISPs to track the worst offending spammers. But in a lawsuit filed last week, they say, shocker, spammers abused those systems. The loss In the lawsuit, Microsoft versus Boris Meisen et al. alleges that Meisen et al., created millions of fake Hotmail accounts to circumvent their new junk mail reporting program and smart data network services to falsely label over 200,000 spam messages a day as legit email. Uh, Microsoft says this violates the Can Spam Act. Remember that? We haven't mm-hmm. talked about that in a little... I mean, oh, yeah. Remember. And a bunch of different federal laws. Um, and this is my favorite part of this story. Meisen was previously sued by Microsoft for pretty much the same thing. In 2003, he paid two million bucks in damages or promised to at least, and also promised to stop spamming Hotmail users. This guy Meisen has really got, you know, some cojones because not only has he he been busted, you know, not even a decade ago, then he kind of goes, okay, I'm going to get back into the spam business again. Then they contact Microsoft going, hey, we're gaming the system. Give us our email addresses. We're not spammers. I mean, it's like he's just asking for it. I don't think he should ever be able to eat ice cream again. (laughs) No ice cream for you, Boris. I don't know. This is the kind of guy who would go and rob a bank and then forget <laughs> to fill up his car with gasoline or, you know, or plug it in and try and get away. I mean, hello, wake up. Or more like, hey, I just robbed your bank. Your floors aren't very clean. You should clean them. <laughs> what this tells me is how much money is in the business of spam. Seriously. If the guy got fined two million bucks, promised, you know, went through a whole legal proceeding and then came back and just said, I don't care. I'll do it again. There must be so much money in spam. I think there's something like, there was a kind of a healthy comment debate going on on this particular article. Something like 1%, 1% of the spam messages you know, that we all see and ignore or just go through our filter and we don't even see them, 1% get clicked through. So of the 1% of the entire email population that is receiving this stuff... I guess that's profitable. Well, if this guy's sending out 200,000 spams a day, I was told there'd be no math, but I think that's 2,000 click-throughs a day from, it's a self-selecting audience of dummies. No offense. Yeah, well, Dad. people who, do, yeah, <laughs> just people who, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know who's clicking on this stuff. I, I don't think I know any of them anyway. Well, there probably aren't a lot of people listening, but there are a lot of people <laughs> who get email who click. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a big problem. And you're right. Even if it's a really, really small open rate, way below 1%, if you send out millions of messages, you're going to get people to get... Why do you? Why do you keep on getting messages from Nigerian princes? <laughs> because people end up sending them money. Exactly. They wouldn't be doing it if it was a complete waste of time. And I mean, spam is... It's been confusing people, uh, and it's just getting smarter. I mean, now I get spam Facebook events every day from people who should know better. You know, I, the email spam stuff, it's easy to go, well, who does? Who clicks on that stuff? But it's, it's also easy to fool folks, apparently. So Boomer812 in the chat room says, who needs that much Viagra? And on that note, <laughs> the white HTC Evo is coming exclusively to Best Buy. Woohoo! Best Buy announcing that the white version of the Evo will be available for pre-order today with delivery July 11th. The phone, 199 bucks with rebate after a two-year contract. And Sarah White is the new black. What? Nobody told me. What's the new black? And it's kind of funny because I've been, uh, I, I have dissed the Evo in the past and I've gotten quite a lot of flack for it. So I understand that there's some big Evo fans out there. I'm not one of them. However, I am a fan of white phones. So I, I, I uh, applaud the Evo white Stormtrooper version, as I like to call them. <laughs> um, they will only be available at Best Buy. So you can't go to your Sprint store, uh, at least not right away. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I could think of places I'd rather go than Best Buy to get a phone, but whatever. The Best Buy, you know, it's got the exclusive, I guess. But I like, um, I like the idea that, uh, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of Android phones that are available in a million different colors. But if we're going to compare the iPhone and the Evo, and let's just do that for comparison's sake. Well, I can't pre-order a white iPhone, so Evo's got the edge. And is that the what? marketing ploy here, that because the, uh, the, the white is, iPhone has gotten so popular that thing. now this is a big exclusive? I, know. I mean, I'm trying to be nice, but it's like, I mean, the Evo's really gotten, it's, it's gotten hammered as far as reviewers go. You know, the battery life is terrible. White phone's not going to change that. So in a way, it's like, it's almost like a, oh, okay, well, I could get a white one. That, that's <laughs> better Sarah, than Sarah, nothing. It's got a kickstand, Sarah. Oh, yeah. It's got... The- 
yeah. kickstand. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh but, well. You know, back, uh-huh. back on the white, I a color. <laughs> I can't believe that a device comes out in a different color and suddenly it's big news. I mean, oh, I know. Really, and you know what? I saw something really interesting at SID, which is the information display show. They were showing a type of ebook, e paper that changes color when you press it. That is going into phones where you'll be able to change the color of your phone on the fly just by pressing a button. What in the day? Green tomorrow, white on Thursday. So all this stuff, you know, is all going to be user selectable each day. Well, that was my favorite thing um, that Ford showed off at CES was the fact that you could customize the interior lights of the car, of the cup holders. And, you know, so many people strangely make a decision about their car based on things like the cup holders. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can have red or blue or green. (laughs) I like that yeah i i i will admit that sometimes someone you know i'll be a passenger in someone's car and they turn it on and i go ooh, red you know speedometer everything's red you know where uh for a while you know that volkswagens all had this kind of iridescent blue and that was neat and cool so i admit to i get sucked in by that to a point jim i don't mean to call you out as old but I'm just saying, when you started in this business, seriously, it was all about the innards and the hardware, and it was, you know, really tech heavy. And now it does feel like it's more about the curtains than it is what's inside the house. Yeah, you know what changed it? And I still have this poster. I thought it was so cool. I bought it uh, and um, got it framed. Is when Apple first came out with the iMac. Remember, it came out in. Five, they weren't colors, they were flavors. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what did it. You could have lime, you could have cherry. I can't even remember the other flavors. And nobody tangerine, could even make fun of them. blue, tangerine. Yeah, but, right. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a lime, there was a, you know, and it would be ha, have been easy to snicker at the whole thing, except that every college student in the world had one. Oh, and well, you know who got hammered for this was Dvorak. He called it a purse. <laughs> the, no, no, that was the, the iBook. iBook. That was the, the iBook. The iBook with all the colors, yeah. That was the purse. That was the Hello Kitty purse. <laughs> John C. <laughs> when it comes to texting and driving, adults tell teens, do as I say. Not as I do. What in the... A new study from the Pew Internet Life Project says 26% of teenagers aged 16 to 17 admit to texting and driving, while 50% of adults who text say they've texted or emailed while driving. Um, 44% of respondents say they've been passengers in a car while the driver was doing something with a cell phone that put them in danger. I... I, I, com- I I think this is that like addictive behavior that the the technology creates. I have to put my phone in the back seat. Yeah, I have to actually have my phone. I mean, unless I'm expecting a call and I actually will wear my headphones, expecting that the call mm-hmm. will come in if I can't, you know, if I have to be driving already, I will I will get the phone away from me to the point where I won't be just, even if I'm just at a stoplight really quick. Right. You know, what I think this is probably a product of is we all, the three of us, remember a time where it, it was never safe to be texting and driving, but it was legal. You know, 16 to 18 year olds, they've never known that to be okay. Well, they've probably gotten hammered by their parents. And there are even apps that will, I've tried a couple of these where where you use um, the GPS uh, in the phone. And if the phone is traveling faster than five miles an hour, it'll block texting Mm. um, and all sort of, I don't know if it's all multimedia functions, but definitely texting. And parents are freaking out about this. It's the new drunk driving to them. Right. Well, look, this is just common sense, people. Okay, let's face it. You can sit and play with your radio for 20 minutes as well and not look where you're going. And you're going to get in an accident, too. So, yeah, it should be outlawed. Yeah, we should keep idiots from doing stupid things. But this is a really serious issue. And a friend of a friend of mine, uh, one of my best friends, had a good friend of hers get killed by a 17-year-old who was texting and wishboned her car, mm. you know, left behind two kids, a husband, and it's just stupid. If you're driving, keep your hands on the wheel, don't play with other things, look down the road, period. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, so. it's like driving with your eyes closed, and it's almost right. worse, but you and, know, because and, it's interactive. And you have to, I mean, I've just started getting on my own case about, you know, I got a... Um, the Blue Ant, it's the new voice-activated speakerphone for the car that ties Bluetooth to your phone. And so when the phone rings, you just say, it tells you who's calling, and mm-hmm. then you just say, answer. And then you can have the phone in the back seat. And seriously, I have to do that or else I will end up texting. And especially now that I'm a parent, I'm like, hey, I want my kids to have a mother. So how about I just put the phone away for 10 minutes, exactly. you know? Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mac fans, gamers, rejoice. 
yesterday on live was demoed on an iPad. Uh, CEO Steve Perlman showed the cloud-based gaming service on an iPad and said it'll run on any Intel-based Macs, so no MacBook Air. Jim, you tweeted about this during the D conference. You said that the demo was really impressive. The demo was very impressive. And I, I want to uh, take a step back for a minute because you, Becky, probably remember this, and you too, Sarah. Remember when Steve Perlman was doing web TV, right? <laughs> and he left web TV, and he went to go do the Moxie box. Remember that? We gave it a best of CES. I don't remember uh, Moxie, but I remember he was at web TV, and everyone was like, oh, man. I think he was at Moxie. Anyway, he left and went to do this thing, Reardon. And this was eight years ago, and we were all asking him, what are you going to do? And he's like, I don't know, but it's going to be really cool. Eight years later... It's basically this cloud streaming service that allows you to do HD style video through the cloud to any device. I mean, he was showing, if you're familiar with the game Borderlands, mm -mm. he was showing Borderlands playing on an Xbox 360 at their server farm on an iPad, on an iPhone, mm -hmm. on an old slow box. And it's really, really cool looking. The demo is great. But the problem is in the details. Now, first of all, you need three or higher megabits per second to the house, which is, you know, you DSL guys are going to have some issues. Second of all, you have to pay a, a monthly service fee and you have to pay for the games. So it's more expensive, it looks like. And even though you can play Xbox games, you don't get Xbox Live. So all that interaction is not there. Well, you know what also, you know, it makes me kind of wonder, it's, um, you can play these games, games that people are already familiar with, you know, familiar with downloading, not necessarily streaming, on an iPad, and you go, wow, that is so cool. But people use iPads completely differently than they game on other systems. So are the game developers now going to, I mean, are they just going to sort of take that into consideration that you might be doing all this touching? Are there going to be two different kinds of games based on how somebody's going to receive the game? I, you know, it's, it's that whole behavior thing that's really interesting to me. You are absolutely right. He was at Moxie. And Jim, I'd never call you out on any factual details. Um, what I do remember, though, that pertains to this story is Phil Schiller trying to demo games on a Mac during one of the Apple keynotes and just crashing and burning um, and sweating. And so, I mean, I think, you know, this, this Mac development, is this significant for gamers? I mean, how do you see this in the grand spectrum? If you're a gamer, look, you're not going to buy a Mac right now unless, you know, it's your gaming tends to Farmville. So it, PC people, gamers will buy a PC, gamers will buy a console. This kind of gives you an ability to play games on some other things. It's interesting. And I, I just one last thing to say about it. Um, you guys know Steve Wildstrom. He used to be the tech guy for Business Week and is a really well-respected journalist. He actually had the best quote of all when I saw this rolled out at D, uh, D8. He said, you know, I would be impressed, but I have seen too many other demos from Steve Perlman that uh, just ever ended up working. So take it or leave it. Uh, Blackberry. We here need to do a mea culpa and say that we talk about the iPhone, we talk about the Android phones. We woefully neglect our Blackberry brethren here. We want to be equal opportunity. That's right. So I went to a BlackBerry event last night so that I could get read in on all things BlackBerry. <laughs> um, and the big news, get this, their app store now accepts credit cards. All right. That was, there was an event for that? Well, they, With food and drink? <laughs> there was an open bar. <laughs> um, the, I had no idea. You could only use a PayPal account up until now at the BlackBerry app world. So now they're going to let you use a credit card. They're also going to let you tie this to a uh, carrier, to you just charge directly to your carrier bill. Um, and I got a little bit of data about their app store. Um, RIM says they have about a million app downloads a day. iTunes has between 10 and 20 million app downloads Still a day. Still a million. I'm impressed. And their Black, you know, BlackBerry, their market share is 40%. So they have not tapped this market either. They haven't got people used to the idea of apps for the BlackBerry uh, or the apps suck or, which they don't all suck. Some, they're just, it's not an iPhone, but... Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be totally derogatory, as, but they are a very different interface, and I'll get to that in a second. But the other thing that's interesting is I, they, they allow third-party downloads. So if you're a, um, a manufacturer of an app, if you're a developer of an app, you can have it downloaded directly from your site. You can use a third-party distributor like Handango. Um, so it's hard to know exactly that one million uh, downloads a day from BlackBerry is only from their BlackBerry app world. Um, 
Oh, think, so there might be actually quite a few more. Yeah, it's, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. Um, they didn't have stats on that, but I just think that it is it is an interesting comparison in terms of the business model for Apple, who's so clamped down. And also, that, that parallel applies when it comes to BlackBerry's advertising model. So in September, they're having an app world for developers, and they're going to be rolling out a new SDK. And the idea with this is that they've contracted with all the major ad networks, syndicates, groups, and developers will write one set of, they'll, they'll write their program using this one SDK and that will work with all the mobile ad platforms that BlackBerry is embracing. Um, I asked them, again, comparing to Apple, how they're going to handle analytics and metrics. Will they allow all of that stuff to go directly from the user device to the app manufacturers or do they have to go back through BlackBerry? And they said, no, they won't intermediate that, that they'll let it go directly back to the um, app manufacturers. And then probably the most interesting thing that I thought they were doing is they acquired Dash Navigation. And if you'll remember, the Dash GPS would provide real-time traffic based on the travel times of other Dash users. And that was the coolest feature of it. But the problem was they didn't have enough Dash users out there, so all that stuff was pretty useless. So when BlackBerry acquired Dash, what they've done is put that technology, it'll be in all of the BlackBerry devices and you have to opt out of it. So every BlackBerry device traveling down a road will be reporting traffic time back to the BlackBerry servers and they're making those available, uh, that API available for all the developers so they can create anything they want using that massive amount of traffic data from all BlackBerry users. Interesting. Well, that will certainly make it more effective. I wonder if people are going to be upset about the opt-out part. Yeah, Jim, what do you think in terms of the fact that, you know, Facebook takes all this privacy, you know, privacy flack for making everything, you know, that you have to manually opt out. BlackBerry doing this about pretty specific GPS data. Yeah, I, it doesn't really sound like a very good idea to me, but I think anybody who uses a phone will probably end up, you know, and most people, they ought to turn the GPS stuff off most of the time anyway because of battery life reasons. Um, I will say, and I think one of the reasons why you guys had me on is because I'm kind of the token BlackBerry user, too. <laughs> I uh, wasn't sure. You, that and sentence man. sounded weird at the beginning. <laughs> you're also the only yeah. token man. I mean, Jammer being no offense, but, you know, okay, I'm yeah, just saying, right. that's so why the token, we have you on here. That's you're the true. token guy, the token Windows user, the token BlackBerry user. Pretty much. Um, yeah, but, uh, um, you know, one token thing on, just on the... hippie also, you yeah. forgot about that. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I should all act hippie too. <laughs> One of the things that I think is important on the BlackBerry stuff, you know, two points just to comment on the story. One is that um, there are so many different types of Blackberries and not all of them actually support all the apps. So one of the reasons why is, you know, older Blackberries just don't support apps. Um, so the fact that they have 40% market share, uh, that's not, those aren't all app enabled phones. And the second thing is we know this, I'm, I'm just, um, because we're developing versions of apps for Revision 3 for all these different platforms. Our iPhone app just went up today. We got iPad on development, et cetera. BlackBerry is one of the hardest platforms to develop on of all of them. We're not doing a BlackBerry app because it's too much of a pain in the butt. So any work they can do on the SDKs to make it easier is going to be good. Until they make it an easier platform to develop on, you're not going to see a lot more apps. That was definitely the message that I got from their head of... Um developer relations basically was his title and he was saying this app world in September is all about making this easier for developers, making the making it easier to monetize, making it easier to have a standard development environment. They're definitely changing. They have a GUI based SDK, uh, a GUI based portion of the SDK to make it easier for developers. So I think they get the message. It's hard to know if that's just marketing or if that's really going to happen. Well, they need to do it. That's clear. Well, yeah, I mean, as Jim says, companies like Revision 3 will just go, eh, we don't have the manpower to do this. We're going to have to revisit this someday when it's easier. So get on well, yeah, it, baby. And the, and the rumors are that they are coming out with a tablet and an iPhone-style device with a slide-out keyboard underneath, you know, to go along with the storm. So, uh, you know, they want to play in these bigger form factors like the iPad but they need to make it a lot easier for people to build stuff before they're going to be taken seriously. Yeah, the interface issues are definitely um, were something that I noted last night. They were demoing the deadliest catch game on the BlackBerry. Um, and it was, you know, you kind of drive your boat around, you decide who you're going to be, and you look for crabs. And it was not super compelling. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I know that's not their demo, but still yet, yeah, they're definitely going to have to work out their interface issues. Now, one app 
on the BlackBerry that is compelling is the Slingbox. Uh, they said it was one of their most popular, and they told me that uh, you currently you can get the app from Slingbox directly, but uh, it's coming to the BlackBerry app world soon. And this is the perfect segue for me to tell you that this episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Slingbox. Woo-hoo. Slingbox lets you watch your home TV anywhere you go on almost all portable devices of that nature, iPhones, iPod Touches, Blackberries, laptops, MacBooks. Uh, here's how it works. You go to Best Buy, um, purchase a Slingbox, bring it home, hook it up to your TV and to your internet connection, and it slings that TV anywhere you go. Um, imagine right now how huge this would be given World Cup. And I'll just tell you right now, there will be no scores disclosed at all on this show. We have made a pact, all of us, because I know a lot of you have DVR'd the games. We don't know when you're going to watch or listen. If you're not live, won't spoil it. We respect your time shifting we here do, at Tech News today. For the most part. For the most part. <laughs> hey, might- Mars, <laughs> hey, Mars beat Venus three to nothing. Uh, Jim, darn it. And the Bachelorette picked. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can... Check out a Slingbox at a Best Buy near you or at slingbox.com slash twit. A wild story out of Pakistan. The Pakistani Deputy Attorney General files a petition against Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook calling for his death, life imprisonment, or a hefty fine. And why is this? The BBC Urdu language site is reporting via the register that... Pakistani officials have launched a criminal investigation into Zuckerberg and others in response to Facebook hosting a Draw Muhammad contest on its site last month. And to recap, the site was blocked in Pakistan from the middle of May to the end of May, um, but the block was lifted when Facebook removed uh, the the page in question in Pakistan and some other other countries. Um, According to English-language Pakistani newspaper The News International, The officials cited Facebook officials with a violation of their country's Section 295C uh, portion of the penal code, which reads, use of derogatory remarks, etc., in respect to the Holy Prophet, by words spoken or written or by visible representation, imputation, innuendo, or insinuation, shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable for a fine. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, imprisoned for life, not so much, but we now know... Facebook could probably afford a small fine. Reuters reporting their revenue in 2009 was as much as $800 million, uh, citing two unnamed sources. They say they made tens of millions of dollars in profit. Jim, tens of millions of dollars? Is that big for a company the size of Facebook? You know, it, I mean, it's for a company growing like that, it's always nice to make a little bit of a profit. It, it lets people know that you have a, an ability to run a real business. But I think what's really interesting are the numbers that they were talking about. So look, at, think about $700 million in revenue a year. You know, that works out to, let's say it's, you know, a little around $60 million a month. They're doing, um, you know, I was doing a little bit of research on that. They're, they're $60 million a month. They have $134 million visitors a month. Which means that uh, you know unique visitors, which means that they're doing, you know, a, a, about um, I don't know. It, it it all works out to a page yield of about 0.65 uh, CPM per thousand, which means that every time they serve a page, they're only able to make about uh, 0.65 of a penny, uh, 65 cents for every thousand, or 0.0065, which means their yield basically for a website is really, really small. They're serving a lot of pages and not making a lot of money on it. So what that says is there's a lot of potential to make more money per page or, you know, nobody really wants to advertise on places where people are talking about their photos and their cats and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember at one point, Revision 3 had some of the highest CPM in the business and it's a different, uh, it's a different, not so much the different audience, but it's a different goal when you're on the site it's a different type of engagement i mean that it does bring up the question is is where are they going with this well and becky look our forums you know we've had forums at tech tv we've got forums at revision three you know you've got forums there at twit you know nobody wants to advertise on forums some of the lowest ad rates on the internet are on forums no content control it's the wild west for an advertiser Right, and people aren't coming to interact with ads. They're coming to chat with each other. Right. Although they are coming. Yeah, well, I mean, that just, it also shows to me that there's an opportunity for creating um, more engaged ads. I mean, 
it's it, it, it uh, for me i question the algorithm if their cpms are that low like what ads are they are they pushing to whom and why given they have as much data as they have their their engagement level with ads should be that much higher so it well, is but becky now you know why they're doing all this stuff with privacy mm -hmm. if you look at the numbers it seems to indicate that in order to get their yield per page up they have to come up with more targeted ad units that will speak directly to you in order for people to pay for it and to take your attention away from poking your friends. Right. And so, you know, that's what's going on. A lot of people on the Facebook, they post videos, home videos of the kitties and the dogs and all the other stuff. But if you're feeling like your home videos are just too two-dimensional, well, you're not. <laughs> Hammaker Schlemmer is offering the world's only 3D home video camera for, wait for it, 600 bucks. Here's a description from their website. I love this. The camcorder's two lenses work in unison with its three megapixel image sensor to record slightly differing images, which are interlaced to create a video anaglyph, a 3D video. And my theory is they used anaglyph in that sentence to distract you from three megapixel. Well, and yeah. 60, 640, 640 by 480, 480. pixel <laughs> resolution is AVI files because it's 1998. <sighs> well, look, and when did Hammaker Schlemmer ever release a technologically, technologically advanced product, right? Well, my theory is they're trying to become the new um, Sharper Image. Now that Sharper Image kind of fell off a cliff. It is very Sharper Image. It's like you're, you're, you are the first, you're the guy with the big VHS camcorder at the school play because nobody else has one, even though they're going to be a lot better in five years. I, I remember mean, this is, this is bragging rights, but it's not really that great. No. I remember at CES, uh, I got a pitch from Panasonic saying, we have the world's first home video 3D camera. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be great for GMA. Let's do it. I looked at the press release. They're like, it's budget oriented compared to other 3D rigs. 20,000 bucks. Well, it's in my budget. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> but it's, it's nothing. But I actually, I'm like 20,000 bucks. Okay. That's probably what it should cost. 600 bucks. Um, not so much. That's like the Polaroid viewer. You, you look at cam. this camera too, and I mean, it looks a lot like an electric razor. Um, <laughs> it, you know, I'm I'm just not sure. I mean, I know that it's it's it, you know, it can take still images, but you know, the quality of it, I just I can't get past that stuff. You know, I'm like new iPhones. You know, I mean, it, uh, the 3D camera isn't blowing me away specs wise. Then it's probably not going to happen. Although I kind of like. Looks you know, the, the, the 3D still image thing. You know, with the Nintendo 3GS earlier this week, it's like. I, I guess that that's sort of, I don't know if that's a novelty or if that's something that's got stain power. Yeah. What do you guys think? I don't know. This product looks like it should be made by Ronco and advertised <laughs> at four in the morning on you know, one of those infomercials. I'll be reviewing the infomercial version on Good Morning America in two months. Uh, World Cup, so massive right Loving now. It. Um, a bunch of different stats coming out. So first off, Twitter normally sees about 750 tweets per second on an average day. There were a record nearly 3,000 tweets per second after Japan scored against Cameroon on Monday. Uh, and they've seen the, the tweet numbers just spike massively after goals are scored in all of the games. Um, the most shared video on Facebook right now is Shakira's Waka Waka video. Which I've never seen. Is it a good one? I, I know just, she's got the hips and the whole it's the a waka Billy waka. dancing I stuff. just like saying that. Waka waka. I, I actually have listened to the song, which is okay. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but I just waka waka. It's so fuzzy bear from the Muppets. I can't get past it. I know it has a much more uh, broad <laughs> cultural implication, but it's funny because it's that's what makes me think of. Um, well, Shakira, congrats to you. She's definitely rocking it. Um, the other thing that we've seen a lot of is the meme of the day is the vuvuzela. That's from my iPhone app that I just downloaded. Vuvuzela apps are all over iTunes. Um, and earlier this week, I think it'll just uh, keep on. It'll just keep doing that. Oh, that's so pleasant <laughs> for everyone. So you get I on can't, out of there. I, I'm not going to tell you what it sounds like over my headphones, but it's not a boo boo. It's the new iFart. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sarah. That's exactly what it is. I actually, I, the Vuvuzela started to grow on me a little bit, but yeah, that's an app to annoy your coworkers. The uh, there was a post on Lifehacker earlier this week about how to mask Vuvuzela's. Um, sound using the equalizer in your receiver for your home theater. And basically that they said is you have to adjust the 465 hertz and at 235 hertz, filter out the buzz by dropping each frequency by 40 
decibels. So when I was at ABC on Tuesday, where am I? What week is it? Wednesday. <laughs> I asked uh, my favorite engineer, Harvey, to go try it out because they have all the swank equipment. And he worked on it and came back and said, meh, didn't work. And then I was watching this morning and the um, sideline reporter, Jeremy Schapp, who I'm sure is having a heck of a time hearing the guys up in the booth when they're trying to talk to him um, over IFB, he was wearing the Bose noise-canceling headphones. So I threw my noise-canceling headphones on and eh, a little bit better, but not as significant as like when you're on the airplane and you flip the noise-canceling switch and it's just like magic. So noise-canceling headphones not built to withstand a Vuvuzela. Bottom line, get used to the Vuvuzela if you're going to watch <laughs> It will always Cup. win. That's right. <laughs> and you saw some stuff that was just tons and tons of apps and how to stay current. Yeah, and- well, you know, one of the coolest ones is this uh, World Cup football TweetBeat iPhone app. It's free. It's actually just came out today. And what's cool about it is, okay, so I've been, I've gotten into the World Cup as, as many of us have. Well, Jim, you haven't really, but. No, maybe no, you'll I, I don't know get on the train this weekend or something. But I've been you know I, I was up I'm in the a morning. Mets fan. Mets <laughs> baseball. Well, I'm a Giants fan baseball. as well. I'm an equal opportunity sports person. Sorry about the Celtics, but uh, anyway, so I've been watching World Cup, but I'm not always at a television or I'm not always in a situation where I can watch it. So what's really nice is I've been following a lot of tweets about World Cup, obviously Mm -hmm. hashtags and people get excited about it. And obviously um, usage has been up. The problem is that I have to search for certain terms if I'm kind of trying to figure out someone's in the stadium or let's follow a certain game or I'm not so sure about this. And the Tweetbee iPhone app, it, it basically just... It's categorizing everything for you. So if you just want to search by a certain game, it's got this really nice visual interface. You click on the game, and then it's it's uh, harvesting all these tweets for you so you can kind of follow along in real time. I want the opposite. I want things that will pull all the scores out so that I can actually go use the social media sites. I'm on full social media blackout if I have a game DVR'd. And again, no scores will be revealed on this episode of Tech News Today. So tweet well, you know, I, I only DVR- get if you actually want to know what's going on. Right. <laughs> I, I DVR other sports, and people think that I'm crazy because I'll DVR baseball and I'll DVR football. It's really good to see everybody else sort of getting into the DVR thing around the, the World Cup because it's really not that bad to watch dvr sports as long as you As don't long as you know. can. Yeah, and the Olympics was another good example of certain times just don't work, so you just have to, you have to ignore all of that stuff because somebody's going to ruin it for you. SMB, social media blackout. It's exactly, but that's what you got to do. You cannot be on any of those services because, because someone will, someone even not are, even if it's not malicious, they will ruin well, it for you. Yes. The nice thing is, none of my friends or anybody that I follow is a Mets fan, so <laughs> I don't have to worry about that's them. me as a rugby fan. It's not like I'm yeah, worried that right. anybody's going to ruin it for me. Nobody else has any idea what the heck I'm talking. About. I wouldn't know where the rugby games were. Well, most what of the time? most of the World Cup games that are happening right now are all at rugby uh, yeah. stadiums. There was Ellis Park and all the stadiums all around. It's funny I, I recognize them all from rugby games now in the World Cup. That's fun. Oh, we crossover. got over. Yeah, not so shabs. Uh, we got some email. We Ms. do Lane? have some emails. The first one comes from Justin. He calls himself the commercial photographer from Denver. Hey, Justin. He says, yesterday, uh, so this was uh, yesterday's show with Tom and Kiki, you were wondering about how the $150 royalty that Getty is going to pay out to Flickr users stacked up to typical stock photography. To purchase a stock image, you can find them priced anywhere from three to $4,000 to just a few bucks, depending on the licensing model that's used on that particular image. But, if you're running a half-page print ad on Time Magazine and you want an image that can't be used by your competitors, expect to pay more than 2000 for that image for a month run of that ad. And the photographer typically gets about 40% of the cost of that image. Hope that answers your question. So, I mean, it's all over the place. That's- Sounds like you could go big with this, though. If you get picked for the right, the right ad, you could luck out. Residuals are... Are the way to go, man. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the the photography world, it, it's interesting too, because so much of Flickr, at least when I joined Flickr, and I mean, I've got all sorts of, you know, trip photos and stuff that, you know, pictures that I'm really proud of, places that a lot of people wouldn't go. I was never really worried about people stealing that kind of thing. But I mean, this is stuff that people will pay for. Mm. Um, and it's, it's good to be recognized in that way because I know a lot of um, professional... Uh, well, I don't know a lot of professional photographers, but I've got a few friends who are in the biz who are not interested in doing anything where they're, you know, they, they're not going to be c- compensated on the level that they feel that they deserve right. for their work. So I like I like the idea of people being recognized. And it sounds like, you know, you're not always going to make a lot of money, but... It's worth a shot if you're, yeah. if you're sort of a prosumer. Yeah. 
Chris Stamp in Houston, Texas says, I have anecdotal evidence that the iPhone problems experienced with AT&T are not an AT&T issue, but a problem with the iPhone 3 or the 3GS. I've been with AT&T going back to singular days, and with my previous Samsung handset, I had absolutely no issues with the AT&T network. But my wife and I received iPhones in the last year, and basically he says it's dropped call city. Um, AT&T users I've spoken with that do not own iPhones do not experience the same service issues. And then he says... um, if Apple released the current phone to other networks and it, and it exposed a fundamental problem with the phone itself, the PR, PR nightmare currently aimed at AT&T could quickly become a nightmare for Apple and Steve Jobs. So, the, okay, so if I understand this right, Justin is, uh, not Justin. Chris. Chris. Chris is saying, hey, this is an Apple problem. This is not an AT&T problem because I used to have an AT&T phone and it was fine. Up until a year ago, so you can't even say it's the load. Right. It's the iPhone, so it's an Apple thing. Okay, so if that's true, my question is, why wouldn't have Apple, you know, if if the 4G is supposedly going to solve this because the antenna is this wraparound, it's this new thing, Mm -hmm. why wouldn't they have, like, pushed that at the very front going, hey, everyone's, all they ever do is complain about iPhone dropped calls, We've got a fix. It's new. I mean, wh- why would this sort of be like a almost like an afterthought well, at the keynote? Well, and the the other thing, Sarah, is you know what the the iPhone is not just on AT and T. Okay, it might be on AT and T only in the U S. Mm-hmm. But what about around the world? It's on many many networks around the world. And are they having problems like this? I don't know, but I certainly haven't heard as much about that as I've heard about you know the crap of the AT and T. That you know, what, Jim, that's a really good point because. Uh, I have heard from folks overseas, gosh, you guys are really getting I mean, We don't have these problems. Yeah, I'll have to. Well, there are five carriers in the UK, now five as of like two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's hard to know if their infrastructure is different. There are a lot of factors. There are, there are various, well, I don't know that, that kind of stuff. Well, if it was the phone, the infrastructure wouldn't matter, right? I guess, but. If it was a problem with the phone. But isn't the, the, the point about all technology problems is usually the most complicated ones are a confluence of events. Right. So there's, I think there's an interesting point here. And if you were going to go along with that conspiracy theory, Sarah, the reason why I think they, that Apple wouldn't say, hey, we fixed it is because as soon as they admit they fixed it, they admit that it was broken. Mm-hmm. So, but you'd think, I don't know, if I were AT&T, I mean, AT&T is really, I mean, the bad PR that AT&T has been getting over the last few years is monumental. You'd think that they'd go, listen, Apple. After this week, <laughs> you they, might, do something they might. It's this. been the worst week ever. I you guess know, they, want, they want people. their exclusive contract, so. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of facial hair feedback. Luckily, not for you and me, Sarah. But, Not um, yet, anyway, so I guess we're doing something right. Yeah, that's, that's good. I've been keeping up on the beard. But uh, <laughs> Tom, our absent leader who is in Canada today. He is. He's at a podcasting conference of some kind right. up in Ottawa, meeting other podcasters, leaving us behind. But, yeah, so Tom is... He's grown a beard. Uh, he grew a beard sometime between leaving Buzz Out Loud and starting Tech News Today. And it's been huge news. And people have really taken to it and have really kind of gotten on the beard wagon. Uh, so to speak. <laughs> and I think that Tom's kind of, he's hes kind of loving it. He's liking the beard feedback. And people have been sending in, we've got this album art. If you go to twit.tv slash TNT, it's Tom's Tom's face and, and uh, it doesn't have a beard. So people have been sort of adding beards of various colors and sizes and shapes. But uh, a, 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 a lovely guy, uh, Andreas Johansson from Sweden, uh, has uh, has a has a new spin on how he'd like Tom's beard maybe to uh, to evolve. Let's take a look. The bottom line: <laughs> porn stash, handlebar merit, That's and right. I like it. It is so. What Tom do you think, Selleck. Louderback? Is that I don't Tom or is that it. Tom? Yeah. Well. Uh, you know what? I can see it, and it's very boogie <laughs> nights. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I like it. Well, you know what you can do with a mustache like that. You know, you let it hang. <laughs> You know, you wax it up. What, you can what do. What you do with a mustache like that? No, no, no. Hold on. I was talking about facial grooming. <laughs> you didn't let me finish. <laughs> Say so wax, and you do the little curls. That's not what. Jim Louderback surprised at you. There, there's also you know, the one thing I like about that. You know, there's a charity for I think it's for prostate cancer where they encourage guys to to um, grow the handlebar mustache. What? Yeah, prostate. Um, where? I, a lot of times, again, when I'm watching rugby, 
I think it's in November. The guys all show up with these total porn stashes, and it's a it's a charity thing. Oh, it has nothing to do with it's not a, having prostate no, cancer. No, no, it's like yeah, it's okay. like shaving your head. It's like sure. Baldwick's Day. It's you know, where you solidarity. It's solidarity. So maybe that's what maybe what we'll do is we'll get Tom to grow that mustache in November to support that particular charity. Oh, Movember. I've heard about this. Yes. Mustache November. That's right. right. So we've seen the, the future. Non-ironic mustache month. We have seen the future, people, and Tom will have the stash. Tom uh, isn't allowed to stick up for himself today, but... Uh, yeah, if you stick around for after sort of the, the show, we'll, we'll really beat on him. <laughs> uh, but that is the end of the show. Um, really very thankful to Jim Louderback for joining us. Thanks, Thank Jim. Thank you so much, Jim. If people want more, uh, more Jim, where can they find you? Uh, Revision3.com and Louderback.com is my own blog. And thank you guys. It's been a blast doing stuff with you yet again. Yet again. Anytime. Uh, if you want to send feedback, email to us, uh, tnt at twit.tv. You can also send us a voicemail. It's 260-TNT-SHOW. Uh, Sarah Lane, thank you so much. For thank being you, my Becky. Co-ho with the Mo. It was fun. Yep. For Becky Worley, Sarah Lane, Tom Merritt, and Jammer B. We'll see you next time on News Today.